podcast. Okay, <clears throat> well, um, first of all, good morning, uh, everyone, and I'm um, sorry about the delay. As usual, we have <laughs> some unpredictable items that we needed to oversee, but we're starting the broadcast of Dojo Live, uh, another edition of Dojo Live. We're broadcasting live from uh, the uh, Hermosillo headquarters of Nearsoft, and um, as announced, we are featuring... Uh, Mr. Simon Peyton Jones. He is a principal researcher at Microsoft Richard Research in the UK. Simon, I want to thank you for being here, for uh, having accepted to be part of this um, initiative. Uh, and also, I want to thank my um, my teammate uh, Jorge Hernandez. He Jorge is a developer. He is in Mexico City, in the Mexico City offices of Nearsoft. Uh, welcome, both of you. We really appreciate it. And uh, I'd like to, uh, be, without further ado, because we have, uh, we're a little uh, running a few minutes late, I want to uh, ask uh, Simon to uh, basically, um, there are some folks here who might not be totally uh, knowledgeable of what you're doing, what your work is. So if you can introduce yourself and just tell us of, if just a few words about uh, your expertise and your, um, your career through all these years. Sure, sure. Um, so I'm a um, uh, um, <clears throat> I'm a functional programmer, really. I've uh, <laughs> I've uh, um, I've had the the uh, good fortune to be able to um, study more or less what I like for a long time. I, I uh, graduated from Cambridge University in about 1980. Worked for a couple of years for a small company. Then I went to as a um, uh, as a faculty member to University College London, where I was there for about seven years. Then I went to University of Glasgow as a, a professor for about a decade, um, and moved here to Microsoft Research in Cambridge in about 1998. Um, and for all of that time, I've been interested in the enterprise of purely functional programming. Um, by which I mean, you know, the, ex the the astonishing thought experiment of writing programs without using side effects at all. Um, which is uh, first, you know, I first got hooked on this when I was at university, um, and it's I and it's so simple and so beautiful and so remarkable that you can do so much with so little um, that it, I've been uh, sort of um, addicted. Uh, to functional programming ever since. And indeed, one way to look at the research that I've been doing is I've been trying to um, move functional programming from a, uh, a kind of ivory tower academic laboratory setting, which is where it certainly was in 1980, um, into uh, something that uh, professional developers could use to get their day jobs done. Um, and that's what, you know, that's what Haskell has become now, I think. So I was involved in developing the, the programming language Haskell starting in about 1988 or so with a group of um, people from around the world. Um, and uh, my um, compiler for Haskell, GHC, is probably the main implementation that people would use if they're using Haskell. Uh, is that enough by way of a self-introduction? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely, definitely. Uh, and uh, first of all, thank you again, Simon. Jorge, I understand that uh, we have a f quite a few questions lined up, and so I'm going to pass on the mic to you to get the ball rolling. And why don't we start with? Uh, I think we have a couple of questions uh, for Simon from one of our uh, mates here, from our teammates, Janet. So you want to start? You want to go ahead and do the honors and start the the interview? Sure. Thank you, uh, Carlos. Sure. Uh, actually, My pleasure. The, the first questions that the Janet asked was, uh, "How did you become a researcher? How did you go from being, you know, studying in Cambridge and and then decide, well, you know, I want to dedicate my life to to research? How did that?" Oh, I wish I could tell you it was all by uh, careful design, but as these things often occur, it was born by a sort of random accident. So I left university and um, thinking, that's it, I'm done, with, I'm done with studying, I'm going to get a job. So I worked for this small electronics company for two years. It was, when I say small, it was about um, 10 people. And we were always bankrupt and always about to go out of business, but always managed to rescue it. Uh, we made industrial process control and monitoring equipment. But after two years, I was kind of worn out with uh, deadlines and... Uh, feeling that uh, the software that I was writing, if I didn't finish it in time, then nobody would get paid. I found that stressful rather than energizing. Mm -hmm. And then my sister told me that um, the uh, university she was studying at, University College London, was advertising some lectureships in computer science. So I thought, well, I suppose I could apply, see if I get an interview. Um, 
And to my astonishment, I got a job. I mean, this would never happen these days when you need a, you know, at least a PhD to get a faculty job, but it was a permanent tenured position in computer science. So I, so I think in those days, back in 19, this was 1982 or so, um, I think there was a tremendous shortage of computer science faculty. So kind of even if you had a pulse, they would hire you. And uh, so I appeared to have a pulse, and they duly hired me, and I spent seven, years, seven very happy years there. Um, but that wasn't... Research. So initially, then my head of department said, "Well, all right. So I would like to, um, you know, give you an easy teaching load to begin with, so that you can, uh, um, you know, get your research started." But of course, not having done a PhD, I had no clue what research was like or how you might do it. So I would sort of sit on my own in my office, very, uh, you know, quietly with a with a kind of, uh, you know, a blank um, a blank sheet of paper. Um, you know, I would uh, and I would sharpen my pencil. Uh, so you know, so here it was, um, and I would I would I would, I would sit there very sort of ready for the great ideas to come. And the sheet of paper remained blank. Uh, and then a student would knock at the door very tentatively. Uh, and I would say, well, oh, come in, come in, because it would distract me from this terrible business of trying to figure out what research was about. So it took quite a long time to, to, to uh, get started. But eventually I realized, with some help from my um, colleague John Washbrook, that what you have to do with research is just get started on something, no matter how humble, no matter how non-researchy it might be. So I did a little, sort of, almost a development project to build a parser generator in Sassel, which was the uh, then extant functional language. Um, and to my astonishment, I got a paper published about it, and I would sort of never look back after that. It was just, uh, don't be too ambitious, just start something modest, and uh, computer science is like a kind of fractal discipline. It grows ahead of you. Okay, that's a fantastic answer. Uh, and Coming back to something you said in your introduction about how you became hooked on functional languages, uh, yeah. you were there in, 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 in at Cambridge. Currently, lots of uh, most of uh, those of us who study computer science don't really learn uh, functional programming until much later on, until yeah. like our third year or so, and. Uh, but there have been a couple of experiments. Unfortunately, I'm blanking right now. Whether or not it was at CMU, someone made the, uh, the first course using ML, if I'm not yeah. mistaken. Yeah. How do you see the, the possibilities of using a functional language as a first language, as a teaching language? No, I'd like to do that. Yeah. I mean, it, and quite a lot of universities have in the past done that, um, uh, sometimes even using Haskell. Uh, if anything, I think there's been a bit of a pushback in the other direction um, more recently, perhaps because there's so many you know, jobs available. There's a sort of mainstream jo jobs market has a strong influence on undergraduates, and universities are very susceptible to what undergraduates say they want. Um, so if they, you know, if they get taught, you know, get, get taught courses in languages they've never heard of, like Haskell, they may, uh, they, they then say, well, why, why am I doing this? You know, how am I going to get a job with this? Um, but actually, although um, an imperative language is probably the first language that most people listening to this, watching this interview, will have uh, used. Probably everybody's used Excel in some way or another, including the formulae in Excel. And the formulae in Excel are functions, right? It's, Excel is the world's most widely used functional programming language by far, right? So um, actually, everybody is quite familiar with functional programming. What I love about Excel is that you don't have to tell an Excel user, oh, I'm really sorry, but you can't assign to a mutable variable, or you can't, you know, say printf in the middle of a formula. There's no apology there. Of course you can't. I mean, it doesn't make sense in that computational paradigm. Um, so I like that because it means that Excel is a very natural functional setting in which you, um, and so one of the things that I'd like to do, I mean, I, and, and I'm, um, is to um, sort of build on that and say, could we, and you know, I'd like to turn Excel into more of a fully fledged um, functional programming language so that then people would, as it were, start off familiar with functional programming. You'd have to teach them imperative programming. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, that, that actually would be pre pretty cool to have uh, Excel be a little bit more of a, Platform than there already is because you know we, I, I guess we have all gotten those Excel files that have like this whole set of macros that that, that someone has has put in and uh, that is really complicated and that they you know they basically have sort of hammered the, the app into doing what they want yeah and it, it'd be great if it, that that were easier were as I said more of a more of a platform you could more easily develop on. But, but anyway, I, I do think that, that learning a f purely functional approach to programming 
gives you a sort of radical new perspective on the whole enterprise of writing programming, so writing programs. So when you, whether you do it first or second, I think having a thorough, you know, understanding, as in having written some functional programs, makes you a better imperative programmer, actually. Um, and indeed, you know, the functional subsets of languages like C Sharp and Java have grown more and more powerful over the years, precisely because of that. Yeah, I, I agree completely. Yes. Uh... This programmer really, when I first encountered uh, Lisp and uh, Haskell, I really, once I learned them, once I did some work in them, I, it really helped me grow. It really yeah. helped me uh, develop. Even when I was in the, uh, even in stuff that didn't involve doing functional programming. It, as I said, it gives you a new perspective. Yeah. Uh, I'd like to also ask you right now. You left the university and now you're at Microsoft Research. Yeah. As a researcher, how has that changed your your work? How has that impacted your your work now that you don't you, that you aren't you know giving classes, talking to undergraduates or graduate students? Yeah. Um, well, so one of the the um, uh, great things about working at, at Microsoft Research is that they're, they're, they 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 kind of they don't interfere too much. So I'm allowed to study the things I want to study, and you know, rather, I was a bit afraid when I came that they'd be saying that. But then, in the end, somebody would tap me on the shoulder and say, "You know, Simon, you should really work on. We'd really like you to work on Microsoft Word. You know, forget this Haskell stuff." <laughs> um, but no, for you know, I've been here for 17 years, and uh, for all that time, Microsoft has you know supported me right by paying my salary and um, uh, and all the rest to essentially run an open source project for building Haskell for um, hundreds of thousands of people to use. Uh, so I think that's quite remarkable. I really think that Microsoft has something to be proud of there. I'm quite um, uh, think it's a you know, really good thing about the company. Um, but it's but as well as having this sort of openness to um, just developing uh, ideas, one of the exciting things about for, for me about working in an industrial lab versus c working with university is we have a real chance to influence what people actually do. You know, so I can go and sit in the offices of software developers in Redmond who make the products that we all use, and um, you know they're they're not. I need to be in sales mode. I need to explain to them why you know these ideas might be helpful um, to our customers. But there is a much greater chance that something that I do might be influential on um, the products that land up in people's hands than if I'm working in university. And that's a that's a huge new opportunity for a computer scientist to have. Um, and certainly, people at MSR like have been. You probably all have um, come across the Connect sensor. That kind of uh, you come across Connect, so it's this kind of 3D sensor. But it, it's and it and it's it's sort of rather quickly it um, uh, can do image processing to determine your, you know your pose, where your arms and legs are. Um, and a lot of that work was done here in Microsoft Research initially in a fairly pure researchy kind of way, image understanding um, and machine learning. Uh, but then now moved into products. I think that's really quite an exciting opportunity to have. Okay, um, I'd like to go back to a little bit. What we were talking before, actually, we were transmitting for the folks that uh, unfortunately didn't get the chance to join us because of the technical difficulties. Uh, we, we were talking about type systems, and one of the things that uh, that, that are happening right now in this in this industry is that we're getting uh, there's this push for. Uh, for functional languages again, we sort of like hit the, that that part of the cycle where they're becoming more popular, and we have uh, right. some relatively new. I, I say relatively new because so most of these languages have lots of work behind them, lots of years. Uh, stuff like Clojure, which is uh, a Lisp, which is one of my favorite ones, and then there's Scala. Uh, yeah. By Martin Oderski and uh, everyone else there, at mm -hmm. which is a fantastic language, and. Uh, the great advantage of, of those is that they run on the JVM, which is really yep. a popular platform. And how do you see, for example, something like Scala that that lots of people complain it's a really complex language. You know, it's sort of like the C plus plus of the JVM for some people. Uh, how do you see people that aren't used to having such a powerful type system learning to use it? You've designed uh, type systems. How do you Go about learning uh, a language that has a really complex type system. 
Do, do you have oh. any tips for programmers? Oh, well, well, well. So, I mean, a bit at a time must be the answer, right? So, Scala's type system really is complicated. Scala is the sort of union of all known type system ideas. It's an astonishing, you know, intellectual achievement. I, you know, Martin Dusky is just an amazing guy. Um, and the fact that, you know, he's sort of single handedly initially, because there's a big team now, um, built uh, Scala and um, and that it, he designed it from the beginning to run on the JVM has given it incredible penetration um, into um, you know and, and it's it's you know become very widely used in industry so it's an amazing language but it it is very complicated um, and I think very few people could say that they really understand its type system in any kind of complete way but you know, probably you know uh, you could probably count them on the fingers of a couple of hands now Haskell's type system is also complicated. Um, undoubtedly, and, and my my sort of uh, policy with Haskell has always been to uh, sort of let a let a thousand flowers bloom. You know, let's try different things um, and see how well they work. So th I guess there's a few things to say. One is that the core ideas in Haskell's type systems are Haskell's type system are quite simple. So Haskell uh, uses makes very strong use of parametric polymorphism in which you say this function has type for all a you know list of a to list of a so and so the and we really mean for all types a so this side uh, but on the other hand it does not make use at all of subtyping when you say this you know a car um, is a kind of vehicle and a you know a Renault is a kind of car um, so the combination of parametric polymorphism and subtyping really does induce a lot of complexity and, and Scala has to face that um, partly because it's sort of of its OO connections, um, whereas in Haskell we've always sort of stayed, uh, we've stuck to one you know very powerful idea and tried to push that a long way uh, rather than to try to you know have all all possible ideas. So you can regard Haskell as a kind of thought experiment for how far can you go with parametric polymorphism. Um, and one other thing to say about um, Haskell's uh, uh, admittedly extremely large um, type system is that it has its core unity is expressed um, in the following very concrete way that you can take all of Haskell's all, all of source Haskell and compile it indeed this is what the compiler does translate it into a very small core language this is called system FC in, in a, uh, academic papers or just the core language when you're talking about the compiler and it's really very small it's just the lambda calculus um, but it's a typed lambda calculus, so it's got uh, lambda application, let, case, constructors, um, literals, um, and then it has cast and uh, coercions, which are um, their, their bits to do with the type system. So it's really only you know a dozen different language constructs represented by a very small data type. Um, so all of that somewhat ad hoc complexity in the source language gets compiled to this very small intermediate language and it's statically typed the intermediate language is statically typed so every transformation the compiler does every optimization every transformation is you can be type checked of course it should never produce a type incorrect program but it's a very good sanity check on your optimization so um, uh, the reason for saying all this is because it means that this central core means that the source language has a certain intellectual coherence because it can all be explained by translating to this core. If you understand the core, you can always understand any source language construct by this translation. Rather than saying, well, I kind of have a vague idea what it does. You can have a precise idea what it does. Um, and I suppose the last thing to say about you were talking about how do you learn it is when I, I said a bit at a time is that for the most part, what you don't know won't bite you. So if you want to write functions that are monomorphic, don't even use polymorphism. Have type int to int. That's fine. You can do that. But they may seamlessly work over, you know, if you write f of x is x times x plus 1, then that does have type int to int, because it'll take an int to produce an int. But actually, it also has type for all a, num a, double arrow, a to a. That is, for any types that are numeric type, it'll take. So, so it'll, it'll sort of work in the monomorphic case, and it'll also work in the polymorphic case. And that's really the, the hope that... Um, uh, the, the the bits of complexity that you're not using hopefully do not bite you uh, very much. I'm sure that's not entirely true. You'll probably find people who say the reverse, but that's the effort we try to make. And that's, that's, uh, that's actually real great. That And uh, as you say, that's that comes directly from, uh, as you mentioned, that uh, you have really one central idea, that the language is not all over the place and trying to include lots and lots of stuff. 
Yeah. You have this one central idea that you, you push, as you said, as far uh, as possible. So in the, yes, in the area of type systems, the idea, central idea is parametric polymorphism. And in the area of dynamic semantics, it is purely functional programming. That is programming without side effects. So really, I would say that Haskell has two central ideas, parametric polymorphism and programming without side effects. And we see how far those two can go. Uh, don't you know the second one? Lots of uh, programs, because of the way we actually start learning to program, which is really not, we don't touch functional language until much later, uh, have like a really hard uh, time wrapping themselves around the idea of uh, how do I do things if I don't have side effects? Uh, how do I, you know, like, how do I print Hello World to the console, you know, which is a side effect? Yeah. How, how do I do that? That kind of stuff, and uh, that of course touches uh, on monads, which like there are. I, I don't know. There there must be like a, a thousand tutorials out there, a thousand uh, blog posts trying to explain exactly what monads are. Uh, but one of the things that I've uh, I learned is that you don't really need to understand the, the math, the, the the theory behind it to to use yeah. uh, to use uh, to use to actually make practical things with uh, with with the language, the theory is uh, of course beautiful and and uh, lovely and interesting, you know. It's, uh, and uh, when you have time to dig into it, uh, of course you you should if you if you want to. But we don't need that to to build things. So right now, looking aside at that at that uh, at that theory, leaving it aside a little bit because you. When I ask the phone question, you are going to have to, to touch a little bit on, on that. Uh, where is Haskell going? Uh, what are the the next steps for uh, for Haskell? What new things are are, are you going to be working into the the language? Uh, and uh, in particular, why those things and not say others? Huh. Where is Haskell going? Well, so. Um, Haskell now, GHG in particular, is a is an open source project, and increasingly in the last say five years, it's gained um, you know larger and larger numbers of people who actively contribute and propose features and indeed implement them. So my role is increasingly sort of becoming kind of reviewing things rather than initiating them. <laughs> so I mean, for example, um, you know, uh, a month ago, um, Johan Tibble and his colleague um, Adam um, implemented the strict. Um, language extension, which pretty much makes it, and it, it's on a module by module basis, but you can say compile this code strictly. So it's a call by value language rather than a call by need language now. Um, and uh, you know, the how, do you, how exactly does the design work? I don't think it's settled down. Um, another, um, uh, another very cool extension I was, uh, I was, um, have been working quite a bit on, but again, didn't initiate was pa pattern synonyms, where we. Um, uh, most functional languages are good at abstracting over uh, um, things where you construct values, uh, but not very good at abstracting over when you pattern match on values. Um, so, um, uh, pattern synonyms are a way of abstracting over well, abstracting over patterns. Um, and uh, it turns out that that ramifies in quite a lot of ways. I was looking at a, um, a few you know tricky bugs to do with that today. Um, so I guess what I'm trying to uh, trying to I'm trying to answer your question by partly by saying where is it going? It means it's going in quite a lot of different directions, right? Driven by quite a broad spectrum um, of the community, and I think that's a real strength that you know GHC and Haskell are not you know uniquely located here in this office by any means. You know the, the same, it's got, it's a very distributed project now, and that's quite quite exciting. Yeah. Where am I particularly um, thinking about? So two things in particular. One is with Richard Eisenberg and um, Stephanie Wyrick and Dimitrios Vytonitis and others. Um, we're, we're working on moving Haskell's type system gradually more in the direction of dependent types. Thank you. So you and I were discussing earlier that um, uh, I think type systems are the, the world's most you know, widely used and effective formal method. Right? They are like a type is like a weak theorem that's proved about a function whenever you compile it. And it's a design language that you can use when you're thinking about designing your functions. Um, now, uh, but a, a bad type system, a weak type system, an unsophisticated type system gets in your way. Uh, like, so in, in Pascal, if you write a, a function to re reverse a list of integers and then you want to reverse a list of Booleans, well, you have to write a new function, right? Uh, 
But that's terrible, right? Because it's the same code. So then we want parametric polymorphism like ML or indeed Java with generics has, where you can say, I'll write a function that re reverses a list of anything, right? So now you write the code once. So that's an example of the type system has got more sophisticated um, in order not to get in your way, right? Because if the type system gets in your way, then the type system, you know, gets gets a bad name, and you think I won't use it. I'll use a dynamically typed language, or use casts, or some to move everything into type object or something. Right? right. You'll evade yeah. it. So, um, the the name of the game then is to try to move type systems in a direction of being more expressive, that is less likely to get in the way, more able to say exactly what it is you want while not losing the precious benefit to being a type system, that is, you know, types are relatively tractable, relatively understandable, the theorem prover, you know, as a, the type checker, that is, is, you know, runs reasonably fast and produces reasonably good error messages. So, how could we move? Well, the uh, type theorists have been working away on this, on dependent types for ages, right? So, Koch and Agda um, are, are, are examples of very sophisticated, um, uh, you know, dependently typed uh, programming languages or programming lam proof assistants, um, but you do need to be pretty sophisticated to use them. Um, so in Haskell we're trying to use them as a kind of lighthouse to tell us which direction to go in, um, uh, but make Haskell more expressive. So some of your listeners may have heard of uh, that we've got, we first we introduced GADTs, generalized algebraic data types, then associated types and type level functions, type families, then we recently did closed type families, and now like just three days ago um, a huge patch went in, written by Richard Eisenberg, which makes um, uh, types and collapses types and kinds. So now kinds and types are exactly the same thing. There, there aren't two layers anymore, and that means that we can have um, um, uh, that we can uh, do uh, casting and coercion at the type level as well as at the term level. And that turns out to unleash a new level of expressiveness that I think we've yet yet to fully explore. Oh, well, that's so that's one direction, right? Is that the type system is getting seriously more expressive, uh, and just has, you know, in, in GHC eight, which will be out in, uh, you know, early next year, uh, this stuff oh, well. will will be there. Well, <laughs> can't wait to to take a look at it. And, and the uh, other big thing that I'm I've been thinking about with, um, again, th this is a project driven by somebody else, mainly by Edward Yang and Scott Scott Kilpatrick, is um, uh, a sort of programming in the large. Um, question, which I'll explain very briefly like this. If you're designing a system out of software components in which you write one and I write another, you could think of software component as being a sort of building block that exposes some interfaces and it has some interfaces available that it needs, right? So if you've got some Monte Carlo simulation, it might need a random number generator and it produces a Monte Carlo simulation interface out of the top. So the component, as it were, has holes at the bottom you've got to plug into and holes at the top that, you've got to, that it produces. And what you want to build a system by plugging together these components in a well-typed way. One way to do that kind of programming is using ML's functors, but another way that's also been very well explored in the literature is to use mix-ins, and this is a more by name, uh, you know, connecting up the boxes. Incidentally, Scala has quite a lot of this kind of stuff already, um, too. Uh, so with um, um, with Edward and Scott and Derek Dreyer, we've been developing a kind of mix-in system for Haskell called Backpack. There's a paper about it. Um, it's, it's it turns out to be quite tricky. Uh, much trickier than I first expected, but very interesting. I don't I have yet to know whether it's going to take the world by storm or just be a complicated thing that nobody wants to use. We'll see. Um, but it's about this large-scale programming challenge. Yeah, but uh, as I said, well, I, I do hope that it uh, it turns out to be popular because uh, expressivity in in a language is one of the things that at least I as a developer look at. Yeah, uh, a language that, as you say, doesn't get in the way. Yeah, that, that the stuff that helps you doesn't uh, not only stop helping you at some point, but actually starts hindering you. That you do don't run into that kind of thing. Yeah, so it's just really great to, to hear that. Uh, you know, all all the stuff that you, you're working on is actually, at least for me, it's very exciting to hear that uh, it's it touches precisely on that point on the expressivity of the of the language. Uh, Leading off of that, as I said, uh, I've I've worked uh, I've uh, programmed, unfortunately not professionally, and in Haskell a little bit, and uh, I've also worked in uh, 
right now actually I'm doing a, a small project in, in closure and of course closure is not a is not a typed language it, uh, there is an, an extension called typed for, for it to add, to add types but uh, it really is pretty small it doesn't really introduce a very powerful type system mm -hmm. and uh, closure seems to be a popular use language and there are a lot of uh, dynamic languages that are, that are very popular Python and you know Groovy and, and that how do we take people that you that look at type systems and go like oh no that's like too complicated how do we help those programmers see that the value of the type system when they've mostly only faced the stuff like C++ and Java hmm yeah um, uh, excuse me gentlemen can I step in for one second? Too? I mean, just sorry to interrupt, but I just wanted to remind the audience because we're well, we're approaching the final part of the of the of the of the chat, and I want to remind the audience that they can send us their questions as well. Yeah. By clicking on the lower hand side, on the lower left hand side of their screen of their player, uh, they should see a prompt where it says "interact with us" or "join the conversation." Just click in there, follow the follow the prompt. And it'll take you to our Q and A window where you can send us your questions. Then we'll read them off and uh, to to back to Simon, and then he can get back to you here right here. So I just wanted to to mention that. So sorry for the interruption. Yeah, yeah, uh, please so, do. Yeah, that's great. Okay. So again, uh, hopefully we'll have more questions uh, from the audience themselves. But okay, let's uh, go back to you to you, gentlemen. Uh, okay, Jorge and Simon, please. Thank you. Um, so you were saying, how do you, how do you persuade people who uh, have been put off types uh, yes. uh, why they should use them? So, so one of the first things to do is to say is, that it, it, I, I think the the whole sort of you know static versus dynamic typing is a bit of a sterile debate. There isn't sort of one true way, really. Um, and indeed, um, as you say, many dynamically typed languages have grown, you know, some kind of lint or you know type checking extension, right, to try to uh, you know find at least. Uh, you know, common sources of errors, which is what type systems are doing. Um, and indeed, at the other end, um, languages like statically typed languages like Haskell have all grown dynamically typed extensions. So Haskell has this, um, you know, the typable class and the ability to inspect a sort of runtime reflection API that lets you do essentially dynamic type testing at runtime um, and have that reflected into the static type system. So um, uh, uh, Phil Wadler puts it, or, or, or when he says so, um, um, or, or Eric Meyer, I forget who, who which of the two, he, he said, well, you know, static where possible, dynamic where necessary. Um, and uh, so I don't think it's, uh, um, what's the word, constructive to cast it as a kind of, you know, uh, as an oppositional uh, debate. Um, but I would encourage people who've, um, uh, you know, uh, primarily used to, um, to dynamically typed languages to explore you know the benefits of, of static typing because I really, for me they seem to be um, very very persuasive. Uh, so you know where static typing does not get in the way, and we've discussed that more sophisticated type systems mean that it doesn't get in the way, and that even static statically typed languages usually have a trapdoor that lets you get back at dynamic typing when you want it. Where it doesn't get in the way, it's incredibly helpful. Um, partly as a design language, um, so often just writing the type of a function can be incredibly helpful in understanding what it does, um, like a little lightweight specification of it. Um, but also, it's very helpful in maintenance. So if you have a very large 20-year-old code base written in um, uh, uh, an untyped language um, that was written by other people 10 years ago, um, and you wanted to make some foundational change to the basic data structures, you would hesitate to do so because it would you'd not be confident of finding all the places in which that data structure was going to be used or consumed or modified. Um, when, when you've got a type system, it forces you to find all those places. It leads you to them um, uh, statically rather than waiting for dynamic tests um, to fail. And I, you know, a system like GHC itself, however many tests I'd written, um, I would be very, very unconfident of finding all the bugs if I didn't have a static type system to, um, uh, to uh, sort of help me out. So I see it as a kind of static type system as a kind of tension-focusing device. It makes sure that um, uh, that I look at the things that need to be looked at, um, and that doesn't solve all my problems. I still have plenty of bugs in my programs, um, and mostly it doesn't get in the way. You just got to get you, after a bit. You discover it stops getting in the way um, because you're using a good enough type system. But 
touching off of that, where, where you said that uh, about dealing with legacy code, code that isn't, uh, most of the time isn't really that well documented, if it's documented yeah. at all. Uh, code that no longer, that no one longer, any longer understands, at least at the company, maybe you can, you know, write an email to some dude that's uh, retired yeah. and hopefully he's still alive. Uh, to ask him how this critical piece of software that uh, he wrote 30 years ago works, uh, but uh, lots of time that, that isn't possible. And uh, the type system, as you said, it's, it, it helps you because there's uh, this, I'm not a fan of the, of, of the practice of saying that uh, code documents itself. I'm really, really a fan of having actual written documentation in actual natural language besides the the, the code itself. Uh, but the type system, as I said, sometimes when you write the function, when you use, you know, you decide, well, it's going to be this type, it's going to receive this, it's going to return that particular type of thing. Uh, yeah. It actually it helps you clarify a lot what it is that you're actually trying to do, what what the problem that you're trying to solve, how you're going to go about it. And uh, touching back on, on adding expressivity to, to, say, Haskell, how do you go about designing the type system so that it helps, you know, save you a little bit from that, uh, I didn't, the, I don't have the documents for, for this thing, there's no documentation. How does the type system help you document the code? Oh, well, I, I, I don't know. So, we, you know, in designing the language, we designed it yeah. a bit at a time. We started from ML, which had this, you know, incredibly beautiful, small, very elegant little type system that, you know, called um, Damas Milner polymorphism, um, which let you do, you know, lambda calculus with um, let polymorphism. So simple, so beautiful, and gave, and gave you this uh, very powerful parametric polymorphism idea. Then there was one huge intellectual advance, which was when Phil Wadlow and Steve Blott came along with um, type classes. So that was the sort of, and that was right back at the birth of Haskell. Um, I still have the original email in which uh, Phil produced this um, uh, uh, this um, innovation, and it was a, and 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 it 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 was transformational because it's um, initially it was addressing the pretty limited question about well, if you want to say let's say show which takes a um, uh, a value and turns it into a string, a sort of pretty prints it say as a string, well then it can't have type for all a a to string, obviously because you can't do that to any value, including functions and, and, and so forth. It's only it's only possible for some values. Um, so which values is it possible for? Well, you say, you say, for all A, show A double arrow A to string, where show A is the show type class. Um, and indeed, it comes not only is that does that make sense as a way of, as it were, having bounded polymorphism, so it doesn't work for all A's, only for the A's that lie in class show, but also it has an implementation um, thing that, Becomes used. You can think of the show a double arrow part as like an extra argument to show. So it takes a um, uh, a little record of. It's like a little record of the the show methods um, for for the value. So it takes the um, uh, a how to how to turn values of a into type into into strings. And this works for numerics and for equality and for serialization. And then then it turned out it worked for all manner of other things. So it turned out that even though type classes were invented for a pretty limited goal, it's been incredibly fertile seedbed. Incredibly fertile seedbed led to a lot else. Um, and after that it was all evolutionary. Right. So we had um, uh, higher kinded type variables. That turned out to be very important. Um, then um, uh, that, together with type classes, made monads partic work particularly smoothly um, without requiring much of a language extension. Um, and after that, what was it? Well, then it was some. Um, then we got onto uh, you know generalized algebraic data types and type functions. And um, uh, but I will say one other thing for a sophisticated type system, which is that I think it allows you to write programs that would be almost inconceivable otherwise. I mean, literally impossible to conceive, right? So if you look at, for example, at, um, at uh, Edward Komet's Lens Library, mm -hmm. um, it, it's a, it would be hard to imagine writing that library without the types to almost as the intellectual scaffolding that allows you to think about it at all in the first place. If you're just thinking in an untyped language, it's hard to imagine conceiving of the Lens Library. Um, once you start to think in the vocabulary of, you know, functors and, and um, 
and and applicatives and uh, higher order functions and uh, you know uh, higher kinded polymorphism um, higher ranked polymorphism then these things become possible and with, without it it's of course it you could all you could re-render the lens library in closure absolutely it would work just actually, fine actually um, it would be hard to think of it in the first place and and you're totally right uh, the scaffolding that the type system gives you you really do need it there because yeah. otherwise it's it just becomes you sort of like uh, get stuck in in the it's sort of like walking through really heavy snow. Yeah, yeah, because you got you know, you know seven levels deep of arrow yeah. nested arrows. It's just impossible. Yeah. So um, so we we've we've stressed oh. several things about type systems maintenance. Um, you know, of course, of course, establishing some invariants. You know, no memory leaks. You know, I'm not we're never going to segfault software maintenance. But I'll, and we're also now talking about create creation in the first place. Is that it's a design language that lets you write programs you couldn't otherwise get to, and that I think is a pretty compelling advantage too. Once you, but of course, that only happens once you start to do it. It's difficult to explain that uh, in a compelling way uh, to somebody who's not uh, had that experience. Yeah, if you you haven't run it, but. Uh... I, I did see because I did see the the library in Haskell, and I thought it was oh well, this is super cool. And at the time, I was working in, in some some couple of things in Clojure, and, I, and I, you know, I was really doing these modifications in these deeply nested structures. And yeah. I thought it'd be fantastic if I could you know use this. The, someone must have done already the, the work of uh, of doing this because it's so useful. You know, so once you see it, it's like such a beautiful idea that you know you you want to use it. And yeah. I went and looked, and yes, there were some libraries, and it. And it was like, oh my God, it's not exactly the same. And why is it not the same? Once yeah. it, this is a, well, you know, I, I love kosher, but uh, the one thing I don't love about the language is that it's dynamic. It doesn't have that type system. Yeah. It, you know, for me, it's, it's really hard because it's like being pulled in into directions. I love the the, the lisp. I, I love the lispiness of lisp of of kosher. And on the other side, is like, oh, but the type system, the type system is so beautiful. It's so so useful. And. Uh, yeah, I, I totally ran into that, and at that moment it was like, oh, how I wish uh, you know, if I, that that I could have uh, had both at, at the same time. But uh, sometimes you know, you make the sign decisions, and uh, yeah, and all credit to Rich Hickey. I mean, you know, closure yeah. is a remarkable achievement uh, because the, you know it's a started off as you know just him, and he's made this language that has had major impact, right, across the developer community. That's an amazing achievement, and you know, he should be honoured for it, and I think is. Yes, yes, you're totally, totally right about that. Uh, I guess uh, we are about running out of time, right, Carlos? Yes. Yeah, actually, we have a, a couple minutes left. But uh, before we uh, finalize today's uh, broadcast, I would like to ask um, uh, Simon one question, if I may. Uh, <laughs> and this is more, of course, needless to say, because, like I said at the beginning, I'm not an, an engineer myself. But, but I, uh, from the let's let's put it this way. I hope I'm using the right words. From the inspirational side, or uh, uh, towards the developer community, and in that context, uh, I've read that some folks call you a visionary, and I'm curious as to whether how you envisioned yourself. How do you consider yourself? Do you consider it to be a visionary, or what, or who, or would you say, would uh, if you were to think of Hey, I have this, you know, vision. Uh, how can you inspire the newer generations the, uh, of of, of uh, developers to uh, towards the future? Now that you have been labeled as a visionary by some <laughs> people, well, that's very generous of, of people to uh, to <laughs> thus label me. Would be, um, I would, uh, uh, I think, I would say something a, a bit less ambitious, which is that I'm a person who's um, been privileged to have the opportunity to be able to take a few simple ideas and to pay sustained attention to them. So. You know, this stuff about type systems and the stuff about purely functional programming, which are the two sort of motivating ideas of my sort of research life, I suppose, have gone very, very far. And I think I count myself as very fortunate to have been allowed to focus such sustained attention on them. Now, of course, uh, the part of the point is that they 
are in some ways somewhat implausible ideas. I mean, how can you do anything without doing any side effects, right? So, or how, mu how much can you do with purely functional programming in a, in a world in which we're so used to the very fabric of the computation being imperative, right? Even if we add up the numbers between 1 and 100, we, you know, instinctively do it by reaching for a variable and saying, you know, i equals i plus n, you know, <laughs> or total equals total plus i, you know, for i equals 1 to n. There's a, you know, the very fabric of that computation is imperative. So to switch entirely and say, could we outlaw side effects entirely, uh, or put them, you know, very hermetically sealed using this monadic stuff? That's quite a, um, you know, it's going to be quite a while before we can make that practical. And that's why I think I'm, I'm privileged to have been um, allowed to to take the time to do that. Um, as to um, um, uh, how to inspire people, well, so I suppose I'm one of the the things that we haven't talked about, which I'm deeply involved in, is trying to um, think about how to educate our children. So in, in Britain, we've mostly educated our children um, about uh, computing technology. We had a subject called information and communication technology. And I've been working over the last few years with a group called Computing at School in Britain. If you just type computing at school into your web browser, you'll find um, Kaz's homepage. And we've rather, to everybody's surprise, we've uh, been successful in persuading the British educational establishment to adopt computer science as a foundational discipline that everybody should learn from from primary school onwards, like you learn maths or physics. In other words, not as a technology-focused subject that you learn in order to get a good job, but as a foundational discipline that you learn in order to understand about the world that surrounds you in the way that we learn about biology, say, not because all primary school children are going to become biologists and they're going to learn about computer science, not because all primary school children are going to become computer scientists or software developers. So I think that's quite an exciting um, development here in this country, one that I'm deeply um, committed to, and it has the same kind of fl flavor. It's not mostly using functional programming yet, but maybe that will come too. Um, okay. but it's quite an exciting development. I just wanted to mention that before we finish. Have a look. Computing at school. It's a big community. There's 20,000 people in it. And anybody can join anywhere in the world. I'll just oh, give it a plug. Awesome. Uh, thank you. Actually, I'm, I'm sorry that I, I meant to, to touch on that, on that because uh, I have a one-and-a-half-year-old and, a half year old and uh, you know, it's getting to the point where uh, I like to start uh, teaching her uh, some computing stuff, and uh, because I, I think, as you said, it's really, really important. It's uh, you know we don't learn learn uh, literature because we want to you know create a, a whole bunch of writers. We don't learn biology or physics because we want biologists or physicists. We learn them because you know there are uh, essential parts of uh, of knowledge that we need to become responsible yeah. citizens. You know, in a and and, but, and uh, Carl mentioned um, inspiration. In your question, that's that's what I want. I want children to be inspired by computer science. I want them to think that is so cool. That is an amazing. You know, how can you do this this algorithm that you know that that sorts in uh, you know faster than quadratic time? You know, the, the obvious way to do it is slow. And here's a intellectually simple idea that just dramatically makes things go faster. Or find the shortest path through a network. You know, how does when, when you do that on Google Maps? How does that happen? Um, I'd really like them to get that sense of excitement. Um, and inspiration for the things, for the cleverness of computer science, and also for the fact that they can build and create things that nobody has ever created before, and they can do that themselves. That's exciting. Sounds like an ex definitely like like an exciting ride. <laughs> yeah, it is. <laughs> okay. Yeah. yeah, I just noticed that you shared here in the chat window the the URL. It's uh, computing computing at school. Actually, it's you, you said it yourself. dot org. dot uk yeah. Okay. That's it. So for all folks all out there, you might you might want to make a note of that. It's again, it's computing at school, computing at school dot org dot uk. Okay. W W in front of that, I think. Yeah, of course. Yeah, it's yeah. www dot computing at school dot org dot uk. Okay. We are well. Uh, fortunately, we have run out of time. Um, I deeply want to thank you again, Simon, for again for being part of this initiative. That we have here at Nearsoft, and also again, uh, Jorge, thank you for your um, priceless help and your your enthusiasm about these uh, activities that we're doing. Um, it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you. Just okay, yeah. absolute pleasure. Yeah, and yeah, uh, thank you. It's been fun. Sure, and uh, well, Simon. Um, we're we're going to be in touch because, like I said, we're going to be sending you a couple of uh, a few tokens of appreciation, and uh, I hope that we can be in touch and we get to do this in the in the future as your time permits. 
Sure. Yeah. Great. Okay. Thanks. Great. Thank you all. Thank you so yeah. much. Thank you both. Talk to you Bye soon. Bye -bye. Cheers. Bye. Cheers.